This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Tehran is looking into directing further blows to the opposition. According to the official website for defeated reformist presidential candidate Mehdi Karoubi, the Iranian authority temporarily shut down the group's Etemad Mili newspaper last night, as ordered by Tehran's general prosecutor. Meanwhile, the Iranian government has released French teacher Clotilde Reis on bail. After she was arrested six weeks ago due to taking part in post-election protests. Reese was released into the custody of the French embassy in Tehran, pending a verdict in her case. Joining us from Tehran is our correspondent Rita Albasha. Rita, welcome. Has the closure of the reformist Itamad Mili newspaper been confirmed? Sahar, there appeared to be conflicting reports regarding the closure of the Itamad Mili. Hussein Karoubi, the son of the defeated presidential candidate Mehdi Karoubi, said that Tehran's general prosecutor has informed him that the newspaper was temporarily shut down. The order comes after the newspaper published a statement of Sheikh Mehdi Karoubi in which he launched attacks on the imams of Tehran and its parliamentarians and other officials of the Iranian regime. However, the Itmad Emili chief editor said that today's edition was not published due to a technical difficulty and not due to a ban. The judiciary system is expected to undergo major changes after Iran selected a new leader. Have any actual changes taken place? No, the judiciary system has not undergone any changes. Today, Ali Sadiq Larijani assumed the official judicial responsibility from Ayatollah al Sayyid Mahdi Shahluli. The judiciary system is expected to be more lenient under Larajani as opposed to Shaluli. Some are expecting that Larajani will seek to close the detainee's file, even if it means a partial closure. Some of the detainees gave testimonies before the court, saying that they have betrayed and spied on the country. Therefore, one can't be sure that Larajani will close this file completely. Regarding the French detainee in Tehran, has the news of her release been confirmed? Can you also talk about the Syrian-sponsored mediation efforts between Tehran and Paris? Yes, Sahar, as you mentioned earlier, the French detainee was released into the custody of the French embassy in Tehran. She will remain under house arrest pending a verdict in her case. Syria has played a role in the release of the Iranian employee in the French embassy in Tehran, Nazik Afshar. The Syrian president during his visit to Tehran will escort the French detainee, Clotilde Reis, to Paris on his way to Damascus. Al-Assad was expected to visit Tehran, but the trip was delayed for several days. What was the reason? We can't say that the visit was delayed, especially since Damascus has not given an exact time for the visit of President Bashar al-Assad to Tehran. However, the news talked about a visit by President Bashar al-Assad to Tehran during this week. Two hundred and fifteen members of the Iranian parliament requested that the government reconsider its relations with the U.S., France and Britain due to their intervention in Iran's internal affairs. Parliament Speaker Ali Larijani said that the positions of these countries towards the recent events in Tehran are clear examples of their intervention in Iran's internal affairs. 
مطالبة البرلمان الإيراني بغالبية نوابه الحكومة بتحديد العلاقات بين The majority of the members of the Iranian parliament demanded that the government reconsider Iran's relations with the United States, France and Britain. 215 out of 290 parliament members demanded during a special session that the government go beyond its repeated request of Western countries to stop interfering in Iran's internal affairs. They demanded that the government take tangible steps by translating these positions into actions. Before parliament members made their demand, Speaker Ali Larijani gave a speech strongly criticizing U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and her French counterpart Bernard Kushner due to their recent positions, which he considered examples of their illegal interventions in other countries' affairs. After this blatant bias by the opposition and after their violations that were aimed at disturbing the internal situation in Iran, look how little of an effect they've had on the political and security situation in Iran. The poor American diplomacy and all the intervention by foreign forces in Iran's internal affairs have failed. This reflects the empty arrogance of the West and their feelings of hatred towards other nations. The spark that ignited this position by the Iranian parliament was caused by the statements made by Clinton on CNN, in which she said that Washington has spent a great deal of efforts behind the curtains to support the protesters in Iran. These statements coincided with the statements made by the French Foreign Minister Bernard Kushner on Monday, in which he admitted that the French embassy in Tehran has received directions to provide shelter for the Iranian protesters. This was viewed by the Iranian parliament as a reaffirmation to the confessions that were made by three local Iranian employees working for the French and British embassies in Tehran. The Iranian parliament considered Clinton and Kushner's statements as supportive to the recent acts of disturbances, which are examples of blatant interventions in Iran's internal affairs. The position of the Iranian parliament towards the statements made by the American and French officials clearly validates Tehran's view that these statements were impolite interventions, not attempts to open a new page or to clear their conscience. The Independent Election Committee of Afghanistan estimates that the number of registered voters this year is more than 17 million, at least 35 percent of whom are women. The Afghan women's role is not limited to casting their votes at the ballot box. Two female candidates are running for the presidency, and more than 300 female candidates are running for provincial councils. Our correspondent in Afghanistan, Mary Mubaish, observes the women's role in the Afghan elections. This employee at the Independent Election Committee of Afghanistan is explaining the importance of this much-anticipated political day. Men and women who live in the Bakan neighborhood of Kabul are listening to her. The first row of chairs in the Civil Awareness Instruction Hall is specially arranged for women. The women's participation in the elections is an extremely important matter. This is the second election in the country since the Taliban fell, and we are facing a lot of problems. Samira will vote for the first time since she reached the legal age for voting, but Taliban threats worry her. We want the Afghan Ministry of Interior to provide security on election day. The security situation is very bad right now. The situation of the two female presidential candidates, Shara Atta and Furuzan Fana, is no better. They have almost no chance of winning, and their campaigns have been described as weak.
Dr. Furuzan entered the world of politics after her husband Abdul Rahman was assassinated as the former Minister of Aviation in 2002. Unlike the male candidates such as Hamid Karzai and others who have a lot of money and are capable of organizing big campaigns for the elections, Afghan female candidates face a lot of problems and do not have many resources. For Farida Karana, it's the fame as an artist that helped her become nominated for Kabul State Council. As an Afghan woman, I have been able to have my voice heard as a singer in this conservative society. Therefore, I am now able to enter the political world to find solutions for women and men on an equal ground. The Afghan constitution stipulates 124 seats for women in the 34 state councils. 329 candidates are competing for these positions this year, most of whom are criticized for lacking political experience and providing no clear agendas for the election. All the female participants in these elections may not be on the expected levels due to the security, social and financial difficulties that they face. Despite all of this, in comparison to the situation of women's rights eight years ago, what has been achieved now is without a doubt an accomplishment that cannot be ignored. Hi, I'm Cindy Im. Did you know that Mosaic, the show that you're watching, is almost completely viewer supported? This is the one time of the year that we raise money specifically for Mosaic. With that support, we can continue our uncensored reporting through the end of the year. Our goal is $200,000 and we still have a long way to go. We know we can do it because we know how much our viewers value Mosaic. So when you're done watching this episode, consider making a donation to keep programs like Mosaic alive. Thank you. NATO forces announced that an American soldier was killed in an attack by armed men in northern Afghanistan. Three British soldiers were killed in a bombing that targeted their patrols near the Zangen area in the Helmand province in southern Afghanistan. This came after the Taliban threatened to attack voting centers for the presidential election that is scheduled to take place on this coming Thursday. With only three days before the second presidential election in Afghanistan's history, the concerns about security are hanging over the Afghans and political observers. The Taliban's threats to sabotage the election process have created a crisis in the country. NATO and Afghan forces have increased air patrols over the capital, Kabul, in addition to heavy patrols on the ground. The Afghan government has warned the armed Taliban fighters of paying a huge price if they do launch attacks on the day of the elections. An official in the Marines said that the security has relatively improved, but the situation is not relaxed at the moment. It will take a long time before the situation returns to normal. I'm not very happy about the joint operation between the Marines and the Afghan forces. This pessimism came with the increasing number of NATO soldiers killed and the latest announcement of an American soldier's death in an attack by armed groups in the eastern part of the country. The British Army also lost three soldiers in a bombing of the patrols near the Zangan area in the Helmand province in southern Afghanistan. This has raised the number of British soldiers who have been killed in this country to 204 since their military operations began in 2001. The constant security challenges, the intensifying attacks on foreign forces in Afghanistan, and the numerous threats from the Taliban, all these raise questions about the election process and the reasoning of occupation forces to stay and increase their presence in this country despite the failure of their strategies. Bashir Ahmed Began, candidate for the Afghan presidency, expressed concerns over what he described as undemocratic practices from some of the candidates. In an interview with Al Alam, Began indicated that funds from anonymous sources have been distributed to Afghan families in order to buy their votes. 
There is a growing concern over corruption in the election process and the lack of transparency in some of the candidates' agendas. This is yet another setback to Afghanistan, which is basically plagued with setbacks, as well as the concerns about the possibility of vote rigging in insecure areas that are controlled by armed opposition groups in the country. The city of Nablus is witnessing an economic boom during this market fair after eight years of siege. But the city's real economic revival will not be achieved until Israeli checkpoints are removed. Iman Jabor has the report. The city of Nablus, also known as the city of olives and soap, paid a high price during the Second Intifada and lived under the most difficult Israeli siege in the West Bank. However, the city is witnessing once again an economic boom during this market fair. The citizens here hope that this will bring the city back its golden years, when it was the economic capital of the West Bank. Israel has announced the removal of some of the military checkpoints, which transformed the life of Nablus's citizens into hell. Only those who pass through the Hiwar checkpoint adjacent to the city could know how difficult life in Nablus is. These checkpoints have been imposed on us since a long time ago. But praise be to God, it's a much better place now than before. We welcome our brothers, the Palestinians of 1948. We feel that there is an economic boom. We notice that there is a difference and there are new people coming to the market fair. We have never seen these new faces before. The checkpoints were opened again to visitors after eight years of closure. All the Palestinians of 1948 who love the city are returning to it in their private vehicles or via public transportation to renew the connections between them and the Palestinians in the West Bank. Usually on Saturdays we're allowed to come here. Let's say that almost every other Saturday we can come here. We often come in very crowded buses. We haven't come here since the Intifada. We just started to come here since Israel opened its checkpoints, allowing Palestinians in Israel to go to Nablus. We come to shop here because we want to help them, also because we want to have a good time. That's the reason why we come here, and there are also other Arabs just like us. This explains why they welcome us warmly. Many Palestinian visitors carry Israeli identification cards. They were separated from their relatives and friends in Nablus by military checkpoints and Israeli policies, which divided the Palestinians into several groups. Jamal was born in Balata refugee camp. He lived and got married in areas occupied by Israel in 1948, and he carried an Israeli identification card. As soon as the Second Intifada erupted, he was forbidden from seeing his mother and relatives by orders from the occupation. Now Jamal returns every week to visit the place where he spent his childhood. I used to send my friends to drive my mother to the checkpoint. Of course, my mother had to endure a great deal of difficulties in order to go through the checkpoints. It would take hours for her to go through them. She used to leave at 2 p.m. and never got to see me until 5 p.m. My wife, children and I were forced to wait for hours under the sun before we could finally see her. When I saw him, it's like he landed from the sky. What do you expect? He's my only son. However, a friend used to visit me, and he told me that we are our family, so don't worry. Jamal's mother is not the only Palestinian who has been going through these difficulties. Many Palestinian mothers and families are also suffering from the same conditions. The occupation in various areas of the country has split these families and forced them to live in different parts of their homeland. Despite the recent accommodation on the checkpoints, Palestinians still hope that the checkpoints would be completely removed one day so they can meet their families and loved ones. Israeli troops today shot and wounded an Egyptian policeman along the Sinai border between the two countries. The IDF says the shooting occurred when a routine patrol operating about 20 kilometers north of Elat spotted an armed man who was acting suspiciously. The individual was apparently on the Egyptian side of the border in an area where infiltration attempts are common. The soldiers challenged the man, but the Egyptian officer began walking toward them 
ignored calls to halt and aimed his rifle in their direction. Soldiers fired warning shots in the air, but when that failed to deter the man, they fired at the suspect. The IDF says the Border Patrol troops only realized later that they had shot an Egyptian police officer. He's been hospitalized with a bullet wound in the shoulder. The IDF Southern Command and Egyptian security officials have launched a joint investigation. Four cabinet ministers today toured the West Bank outposts of Baruchin and Nofena Chemia together with senior Yesha council officials. The purpose of the mission was to learn the facts relating to the legality of the communities. The ministers included Interior Minister Ali Ishai, former chief of staff and current strategic affairs minister Bugi Alon, science minister Danielle Hershkowitz, and information minister Yulia Edelstein. Ishai told reporters that it was not a visit to a legal outpost, but rather a tour of legal communities established by Israeli governments. Ishai added, you cannot just remove people from their homes without due process. The visit follows Defense Minister Ehud Barak's decision to recruit, recruit 20 additional inspectors for the civil administration. The move comes in preparation for the demolition of so-called illegal buildings and outposts. Former Arkansas governor and failed presidential candidate Mike Huckabee says that the U.S. has taken too harsh a stance against Israel on the issue of settlements. His comments were made today while visiting Jewish sites in eastern Jerusalem. IBA's Ellie Wagelanter has more. While touring the city of David in Jerusalem today, former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee blasted the United States for telling Israelis where they can and cannot live in Jerusalem, comparing such a policy with racial segregation. How would the uh, government of the United States feel if uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu began to dictate which people could live in the Bronx, which ones could live in Manhattan, which ones could live in Queens, uh, and say, you know, we, we only allow certain people to live in these neighborhoods. How, how would that go over? يبدو أن الجدل حول ما ترتديه المحجبات في فرنسا عاد إلى الأضواء مرة أخرى. Veiled women have returned to the spotlight in France once again due to the ban on French women wearing full-body swimsuits from entering pools in the French city of Imernfield. This young woman's happiness comes from the opportunity that this swimsuit has given her to swim with her friends on Australian beaches. However, in France, women are not afforded the same opportunity to swim at the local pool if they are wearing similar attire. Carol, who converted to Islam when she was 17 years old, did not expect to be the center of controversy that is currently growing in France. I contacted several pools to find one that would allow swimming with this suit, but I faced rejection in most cases. However, this pool allowed it and I came and swam twice. The third time I was surprised because they refused to let me swim using justifications of public health concerns, and when I tried to file a complaint, the police rejected it. Carol considers a decision a political one that is related to the ban on the hijabs in French schools and referred to the recent speech made by Nicolas Sarkozy that the burqa is not allowed in France, which provoked much criticism amongst Muslims. My children were very excited to swim. This is what I am fighting for. This is not a political or religious dispute for me. However, French officials rejected that this decision was politically motivated and claimed that they are applying the same health standards throughout all the pools in the country. As you can see on the sign in front of the pool, some attire is banned for health reasons. A person who is fully clothed can hide injuries, infection and skin illnesses that can be transmitted to others while swimming. Regardless if the ban is politically or medically motivated, the attire that some Muslim women wear in France will continue to be a major point of controversy in a country that recognizes itself as the world's cradle of liberty. Khalil Lubab, BBC.
Egypt is considering a ban on all Ramadan tents in public gatherings in an attempt to prevent the spread of swine flu. However, some doctors downplayed the measure, saying that it would be impossible to stop people from holding prayers in mosques or from taking public transportation. Ramadan this year is different from previous years. The Egyptian Ministry of Health issued a ban on all public gatherings, including group iftars in hotels and clubs, as well as Ramadan tents. In addition, the ministry issued a ban on the use of hookahs, as it's one way to transmit the swine flu virus. These precautionary measures aim to prevent interaction of the seasonal flu virus with other viruses, such as swine or bird flu. However, the measure has generated a major debate, even among doctors. If we want to ban public gathering, then we must ban schools and public transportation. We must do all of these if we issue a ban on Ramadan tents and prayers in mosques. Does the virus spread through public gathering only, or does it also spread via other means? We must exercise courtesy when it comes to health issues. If you feel that the symptoms are those of the seasonal flu and not the swine flu, then the ban is not necessary. This is a general measure. The ban, however, didn't include the holding of group iftars in local mosques and squares. The Egyptian public expressed mixed feelings, with some supporting the ban and others opposing it. I think the decision is wrong because Islamic and Ramadan gatherings are one of the most important traditions of this month. I don't think public gathering will speed up the spread of the swine flu. The government is worried about public safety. The epidemic could spread easily in public places, thus infecting maybe 10, 100 or even 1,000 people. The decision is very good. However, people will not abide by it. The Ministry of Health must monitor its implementation. Many believe that the decision of the Ministry of Health will not be carried out as intended. It will be very difficult to cancel Ramadan traditions, which the Egyptians have gotten used to, even if it was due to fear of swine flu spreading. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.